this is Jim Schaefer, host and executive producer of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randy Beyer, and we're going to talk about education and train wrecks. Not necessarily the same <laughs> thing, but right. still, it's a fascin right. those are fascinating topics. Right. The academic world is ready to pounce on any topic worth doing the research on. So, you want to talk about the math and movies? Well, this one, yeah, I'd love to. This is math and math goes to the movies. Of course, it's got the marquee bit. Uh, Burkhard Polster and Marty Ross. Uh, they talk about well-known movies that might come to mind, like uh, Good Will Hunting. The first thing I did was say, okay, do they talk about Good Will Hunting? Um, and uh, others such as Stand and Deliver, A, the, a Beautiful Mind, of course. Um, and others from the 50s, 40s, way back in film history. Uh, they seem to have broken down the films into types of films. So, Beautiful Mind or uh, The Goodwill Hunting. Well, Goodwill Hunting is under the category Whiz Kids. So, it's about smart math people. Smart people. The Beautiful Mind would be under. Um, uh, actually, I don't know the exact category, but they have a different a different category, like you know troubled philosophical issues, you know, the mind is too big for the person that the holds genius. it. The genius. The uh, genius. That, thank you, that's the best. Um, and even the movie Die Hard appears in here because, you know, there's, there are these mathematical uh, uh, computations and problems going on. Um, so there are certain tropes in movies that work and some of the math figuring out what's going to happen in a detective or a mystery movie and things based on calculations. It's, it's interesting how so many procedures are, are really behind a lot of the things we see. Uh, and so chapter by chapter they work through these. One thing that struck me, I started thinking about music when I was perusing the volume here, and that is that uh, many of the number calculations that are mentioned in this book I learned about through music. Fibonacci series, for instance, uh, um, uh, numbers that when added, added to themselves come up with the next number. Um, the golden section, the golden mean, the relationship of a spiral, if you look at things in nature or in, um, uh, in musical compositions. Uh, the, the calculation pi for the circle, the formulation that gives you the radius uh, or the circumference of a circle and so forth. Uh, it's just kind of fascinating. And then, of course, they have, they mention comedies, Abbott and Costello, uh, certain goofy things that just come out of slapstick and things of that nature. But there's a lot of serious, serious math, mathematics in here where they talk about, say, tessellations and diagrams and formulations that are way behind our, what's going on. For instance, calculus, where you calculate, uh, you take a shape of a bowl, what's going to be the circumference of any slice of that bowl or the total volume, uh, sorry, square inches or whatever, of a slice of the bowl at any time? That's a calculation, a function that, you know, depends on its height and its width. Um, and things like that go on in, in the movies, and there are scenes where there's a scene, literally, they're talking about, okay, this is the scene where so-and-so character explains to the class a computation and then there are more subtle things where this is the computation that's behind the scene in this mystery or in this you know this evil guy's mind who's trying to figure figure trying to beat the system and you know get the get the money from the the bribe and things like that so it's it's interesting but there's a there's a kind of a, an academic approach behind uh, looking looking at uh, uh, certain key figures that we might know in popular culture and how that relates to the field and how it's reflected. Because we have kind of a troubled view. <laughs> I don't know if troubled is the right word. We have a, a we, society has images of, of mathematicians. And of course, there are serious social issues of the place of women in mathematics. There's a whole category, you know, women mathematicians, movies about women mathematicians. And there's their struggle against a system that's almost entirely perceived as male. Uh, you know, the drop-off of girls who are very good at math and then they get to college or late high school and it drops out. 
and they're you know the science they're they're not encouraged to continue it w in one way or another. So it's a, it's an interesting volume. They touch on all these aspects. Well, and if you look at math as a language, uh, it's a deeper um, frame for mm -hmm. understanding what's going on. But the other thing with math is. I like this book because it shows you the underpinnings of what we take for granted, and that's what academic writing can do. We look at the surface and don't quite understand uh, what's involved with that, and so anything that takes us under the surface to show, well, there's a lot more going on mm, here. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of substantive comments can really help uh, develop a deeper understanding. Right. Well, I was a little surprised when I uh, started looking at the book uh, in some of the more um, uh, obvious, I guess, aspects. In other words, the writers describe a scene where mathematics occurs. So in one case, um, it's a scene about kids being asked to be in an advanced class. And this one girl needs permission from her mother to be in this advanced math class. And so she goes on and on about why she wants, why she likes it. And she talks about Leibniz and Newton. And, but the whole chapter is about the kind of the development of calculus and this you know, uh, competition between Leib Leibniz and Newton. Who came out first? Why did Newton keep his mouth shut? You know, this and that. It's, so it's about that sort of aspect of math history. Then the next page, the writers are explaining you know, what it means to do a calculus on something. Um, so it starts out with this scene that's a kind of mundane, like, Mom, I want to take this course. I really think this is cool about Leibniz and Newton to an exploration of how that falls into the movie. So, I mean, we become aware of this through this turn of popular culture, really, if we watch that movie. I hadn't seen that particular movie, but... Um, that's and one way to see it. I've seen Goodwill Hunting, and the same thing gets me curious. Like, okay, what is this? Is like on a, such a high level of mathematical proof. What's going on here? What's that about? Yeah, it's quite a, a challenge, you know, and it's so difficult to do it in a way that's comprehensible to the reader, where you're making this far more complex application, I guess you'd say, of math to something that people hadn't quite thought about. Well, movies. There's no math in the movies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there and is. it's right there yeah. all the time. Yeah. Right, right. And that's what academic literature can do, is show you the other side of that reality. You know? Well, even something as high pop, I guess, as Mission Impossible has all these little calculations that actually, this is descriptive, but what they're, they have screenshots and whatnot. Many of the screenshots are somebody at a blackboard doing a calculation. It doesn't get to the film imagery. But I remember in Mission Impossible, the, the imagery is telling you something about calculation. And that's the scene where the drop, the drip is about to fall, and the knife is going to fall, and the, he has to get this essential thing out before the drip comes, and, and it's slow motion. I mean, you can tell there's timing, and there's distance, and there's uh, th there's number calculation going on, and it actually is very effective. And, you know, there, there's your math going on, but it's much more on an intuitive kind of uh, high-tension level. Well, it's done I mean, as por it's portrayal, movie right. because it's a movie, Yeah, but it's not done in terms of the science, but the science has to be the there science for has the portrayal to be there. You, you know that <laughs> somebody could say there's acceleration with that piece of sweat as it drips down your nose and it's going to fall and hit the super sensitive device and kick off an alarm system or whatever or balancing time you've got 36 seconds et cetera, et cetera. so that's kind of kind of interesting yeah another book on education is educational courage resisting the ambush of public education by nancy schneiderwin and myra Saifon Schieven. I, I practice saying their name. How, yeah. how would you say it? I think it's uh, Schneidevind. Schneidevind. And Mara. And Mara Sapon Schieven. Oh, completely. Sapon Schieven or Sapon Schieven, maybe. We have to 
uh, figure that out with them. We'll write them and find out. Well, Nancy teaches in the master's program in humanistic and multicultural education at the State University of New York, New Paltz. And Mara Sapin Shivan is professor of inclusive education. That's an interesting concept. That is. I haven't heard of that before. At Syracuse University. Interesting. Um, and what I like is this book takes a long look at the null child left behind and race to the top programs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what they're arguing is that we need to resist market-driven initiatives such as high-stakes testing, charter schools, mayoral control, and merit pay. <laughs> well, <coughs> this intrigues me because of the title, the subtitle, Resisting the Ambush oh, of yeah. Public Education. So this, what is the ambush of public education? Like all of a sudden, here are these no child left behind requirements that you have to show accountability. Your testing will give you the results and even the, the money to support your program. And well, one of the wicked truths that I happen to know because of my studies mm -hmm. is that the No Child Left Behind Act, the substance of it was plagiarized from a report by the Council on Higher Education saying don't do this. And the name was taken from a woman who had a foundation to help children so they wouldn't be left they behind. They wouldn't be left behind, okay. And then the purpose, which a lot of people don't remember, was to discredit public education um, so that support, financial support could be given to private charter and parochial schools. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose. And so one way that you know that it's an invalid action is when you rely so heavily on standardized testing. Yeah. Because standardized testing depends on cultural knowledge. And if you were, were in your educational background, you didn't get that cultural knowledge, there's absolutely no way that you can get a good test score. And that's mm -hmm. what they mean by the, the ambush. Mm -hmm. And it's really serious because um, it's having an immediate impact on the educational system where they're closing schools. I mean, Detroit itself is in the midst of I think they closed like half of their schools and handed them over to charter schools. Uh, and I was at this conference just yesterday, uh, this young third grade teacher, I say young, I mean, she's been teaching maybe five years and she's already been laid off three times. So, I mean, it's devastating. Right. You know, she's very bright and, you know, right. it wasn't until we started. Talented teacher. It's yeah, a, it's wonderful a stuff. not to have her teaching. Right? Wonderful yeah. stuff. Early but that's what's teacher. happening and the students are picking up on this. And now, the students that I'm getting in my college writing classes are, are just numb. I mean, they can't think and they can't write and they're just not interested in it. And so it's a real struggle to get them there. And that's what they're well, talking they're, about. Well, they're, they're, the students you're getting, at, let's say 18 to 20, I know you have a lot of older students in your, but of the, of the first time in college, the younger students, they're a generation now that have grown up for the past 12 years with no child left behind, right? So that's, they were like eight or nine when they started uh, through going through the system that was relying on that here in Michigan. One of the things that I like and they talk about in the book is that they've organized an education network which is a community-based group committed to educational advocacy. So anytime, you know, it's like the old Joe Hill thing, don't mourn, organize, mm -hmm. that's very appropriate for this because it mm -hmm. really is nasty what's happening. Um, st uh, teachers are being laid off and not called back. There's an attack on the, the retirement program and health benefits yeah. for the teachers right. where if you stay in it, you're going to be paying more, you know. Well, it's interesting that this book is published this month or this time period, this fall, because there is also a new movie out this year, just out. They're advertising it on television currently. I forget the name of the title, but it's about two women who take over a dysfunctional school. Uh, I, I, I get the impression from the reviews it's a, a city school. They take it over, you know, it's rampant with drugs and bad results and whatever. Um, and they create a kind of charter school private thing out of it. It's the, uh, it, it is the ambush. But of course it's being uh, praised because there's a, it, the, the movie is about the success of it. Well, if the schools... And how they take yeah. over. These parents <coughs> say enough already. It's dysfunctional. Let's take, it, let's take it over. I like this quote here. They quote 
Deborah Meyer in Educational Reform is saying, resistance to nonsense is one of the greatest powers of human beings. <laughs> I love that. Um, but what do you do when the school you teach in or that you have your kids in is just awful? It's not the teachers, it's the school district and how they manage right. it. Well, it could be awful from various perspectives. That's, I guess that's why I brought up the idea of the, 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 the simultaneity of this movie. Because the movie seems to be, whatever, politically, on the other side from this book. I don't know. I'd have to... The, the full, movie is getting mixed reviews, comparison. yeah, because um, it's an attempt to touch into that anger and, and that same question, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. You know, do you organize? Do you create an alternate structure? Um, it seems to have us that the organization to take over comes out with a kind of conservative, uh, you know, accountability-based result. That's kind of what I'm alluding to. Well, as I've told you, the whole reason I'm getting a PhD is to counteract this mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what they talk about here is the book tells stories of educators, parents, students, and community members who are individually and collectively fighting for public education that affirms young people and works for the common good. Mm -hmm. The voices here represent hundreds of thousands of others who continue to protest the policies that have damaged millions of young people. Right and they have the potential to destroy public education. Mm. That's the most serious thing in here. In this conference yesterday, one of the participants said that her son was called out by his teacher, saying, what was he doing? He couldn't write, you know, he would never write. <laughs> you, know, you just don't do that with no, a student. If right. you have an issue, you work with them, try to get the skills right. up to, right up to snuff and uh, he she did he did she did this to the student publicly yeah in the classroom called him out and I encouraged her to meet with the teacher with her son and get it straightened out yeah. to indicate that's not acceptable because that's bullying that is just pure bullying yeah, yeah. Um, the teacher doesn't even understand her own power and sense of how that will live with that person for a long time. well I've had students that, that that's happened to and they lost their voice they didn't write anything more until they came into my class and for a while didn't write anything in the class until I was working with them and the truth came out. You know, they started sharing their pain and then I worked with them on regaining their voice. Yeah. It's just <laughs> horrific. Oh gosh, you think of some things that can happen and really influence you. Here's Ultimately, something. Ultimately, is this an academic, sorry to interrupt, yeah. is this an academic reflection or kind of something that they want to get into the hands of parents and that sort of stuff? It's a community-based thing, mm -hmm. but it, 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 they're talking to educators, mm -hmm. but everyone connected. For example, I like this is, uh, the third part is working in the cracks, creating spaces to teach authentically. Mm -hmm. And you and I have taught about, talked about that a lot. You know, you look for spaces that you can maybe reappropriate, yeah. turn it around, you know, um, and that's what they're talking about is developing students' intellectual, social, and emotional learning. Right. And another thing is, um, not my voice alone, organizing to reclaim public education. Public education is the key ingredient of this country. I'm the worried about culture. this, in the way that global warming is affecting us. It seems like we're... Um, we're eroding public well, education in a certain way. You know, the ice cap is starting to melt and it might reach a point of no return. But what's happening is, what's courageous about just the book is because the, the conservative groups or those are raising this whole thing of challenging public education mm -hmm. are viscerally, viciously attacking anybody who doesn't mouth the party line. I mean, personally, they'll bring actions against you and everything, even sue you. you well, know. I, I know about it just with something as simple as book banning in the library world, but it affects, you know, public schools because uh, the, the, the same issue. I mean, the, the, the public aspect of, of, um, of the books in schools and, and what, what's allowed and the objection to, uh, um, you know, pushing religious... Uh, 
religious education, religious events, religious uh, related things in the public school, which is, you know, a secular space. The opening, the introduction raises this question, is this what we call education? Is what we want to have happen in our education, educational systems, is they have all the students memorize certain things and parrot it back. Yeah. Not thinking, just yeah. rote. You know, <laughs> including the thing about global warming, evolution, all this stuff, just parrot back, you know, yeah, that's okay, you'll get an A. Yeah. Instead of critical thinking and really getting involved and developing yeah. an ability to think for yourself. There's critical thinking at any age, isn't there? Absolutely. Fifth grade critical thinking, 10th grade critical thinking. And to respond to your concern about the, the ambush of public education, it actually began in the 1960s and 70s at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Liberation Social Programs were created to address poverty and create greater equality. But since the Reagan administration, which had a response to that, there has been this creeping ambush of public education. Um, attacking the democratic goals and policies for public education um, with rhetoric about the high stakes testing, vouchers, charter schools, business involvement. This is a serious issue. The corporations are now getting involved and there's a corporate mentality that's starting to emerge in yeah. education. Right. So the students well, think... Their, exactly. Their outcomes can be successful because they are outcomes that are based on a kind of corporate or a business bottom line right. management uh, uh, framework. And you, you, they say, oh, we're getting outcomes, we're having results, our whatever, the, whatever it is, our ratings are getting higher, but they're, they're based on this as aspect of, of knowledge, replicate, I mean, I'm painting a broad Is the product brush here. selling? Exactly. Is everyone buying the product? Right, right. right. When what you're teaching is something yeah. far more complex and, and challenging, and it may take a long time for someone to get it. It's it's the fast turnover versus the you know the the time honored bleeding <laughs> bleeding heart. <laughs> and here are the mytho mythology. Bleeding heart value that is oh well we talk this over you know qualitative it's a qualitative concept that business is not. But here's have. here's phrases that they throw out. Public schools are failing, educators are to blame. Yeah. Uh, which they're not. It's, it's, you've got well, kids it's coming out of family situations that have no food, no clothing, right. or are terribly right. abused. Mm -hmm. High stakes testing makes public schools accountable. Well, no. The testing has to be valid. They're not necessarily. And then it needs to be, it's a, an assessment form, which means there's a lot of planning should go into it. You just don't take a, standardized test off the rack and, uh, you know, give it yeah, to the students. Right, right. The goal of education is competition in the global marketing pl marketplace. How often do you see that, particularly oh, at the college level? I mean, if you, it, it depends on, um, you know, that's, what is that, vocational, uh, vo vo vocational mentality? Well, that's fine if you, if you, you want people to, I mean, you want a thinking public, right? You want somebody who can make decisions, but Maybe you also want them to be successful at welding, but we're talking two different things. The whole thing doesn't uh, it doesn't boil down to well, and, can you get a job in this? And what you know, kind of competition crap. are you preparing for? Are you preparing to be a mechanic? Yeah. Or are you preparing to be an economist? Right. Yeah. Well, so it's easy to say, but hard to do. Yeah. The private sector can better manage our schools. You hear that all the time, you know. So there's some real serious consequences coming out of this in terms of the ambush of public education. I don't know if you found it, but does she ever explore, explore what inclusive education is, her field of study, her, her discipline, the writer? Well, I uh, think it's Mars, the whole thing of including everybody, mm. you know, in a diverse So that a community, it's, yeah. it's the village that grows yeah. the, the system. Yeah. Another thing is the influence of corporations and entrepreneurial foundations on public education sort of the Bain Capital deal, you know. So I thought this book, uh, here's uh, one teacher talks about Neha Single, that she stopped teaching for America to fight for public education. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you do when the profession you're in is giving you choices that you cannot agree with ethically? Right. Yeah. You know, 
Um, well, it's any moral dilemma. I mean, what what's the higher the higher goal uh, in your in your particular uh, field or your particular direction that you want to take your life? And one of the the serious, and this is deepening the cracks to infuse mathematics for social justice. Mm. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. That teaching continues to be an ex increasingly challenging profession as teachers work toward addressing the educational needs of their students while at the same time teaching in a way that helps students score well on their state's high stakes test. Mm. And I get that all the time. And my colleagues tell me they have to stop teaching writing, teach writing for tests. Yeah, right. It's a very bad idea. Um, so I, I think this is a, a great book. Uh, and uh, that's very courageous in itself to bring up these different topics. Uh, you know, and mayoral control in large cities like Milwaukee, New York, Detroit, mm -hmm. that's a big issue because now you have a political person in charge of an educational system yep. and they're not selected. Yep. Yeah. So um, they're talking about making a resistance movement, making a difference, and I think that's just. You know, I don't know if they'll make it, but you know, you gotta love the effort. Um, and there's, they're talking about different specific initiatives. Arizona students protest new law banning ethnic study classes. Oh, well, Arizona's on the, <laughs> Arizona's the poster child for, for reactionary, yeah. I know, I mean. Yeah, very good. Let's go on to your. The train wreck. The train wreck. I'm fascinated by this. I got a short uh, review of this uh, as you and I were preparing for the show. Um, very interesting book, Train Wreck, The Forensics of Rail Disasters uh, by George Bible, uh, or B. Bell, of the Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, what it looks into is the details, the details of why, and there's a lot of physics in this book, a lot of basic, uh, basic understandings of how you know, enormous machines at enormous uh, uh, momentum uh, collapse, uh, just the, the specifics of that. Uh, how trains crash then and now, what happens and what did happen. Moderate spiel, spiel, moderate speed passenger train collisions, uh, avoiding collisions, train control, moving at the wrong speed. Uh, and bearings, I mentioned bearings, you know, the little balls that just keep everything flowing. Gravity, it's the law. I love that title, gravity, it's the law. I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. But big things moving at, at and the toler on low, on discrete tolerances, yeah. Yeah, true. Well, I think we made it to yes. the end of another program. Great, thanks, Jim. I thanks for being, being on here. Here. Yep. See you next time.